I recently watched the Polish film 365 Days on Netflix, which causes the audience to ask itself two very important questions. One, how much violence are you okay getting turned on by? And two, are you a lost baby girl? Are you a lost baby girl? This film follows a strong, independent female lead who is quickly captured and enslaved by an aggressive gangster in Italy, just like I dreamed about as a little girl. Our fearless protagonist is given 365 days to fall in love with her captor, but don't don't worry, because in between teetering on the edge of murder, she goes on lots of fun shopping trips that take forever. So, you know, equal playing field. Finally, a glossy, flashy film marketed towards women that has all the romance and love scenes they want. And frankly, it's been forever since we've had a narrative film that shows the sexy side of human trafficking. So put on your shiniest, shortest, silver dress and let's hit the club. Stay tuned for another clip breakdown of the latest cinematic tragedy to hit Netflix, baby. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another clip breakdown. This is the series where we dissect the film and TV that is interesting to me and interesting to you. Before we get into the clips, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more movies. Let me know what to cover in the comments. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down there. That way you never miss new videos from me. Turn on post notifications and you'll always be in the know. Also, I'll put the link to this water bottle in the description below because some of you said you liked it. And I'll also brag a little by showing you how well I can pour liquid into my mouth. Okay, I should have thought that through a lot more. My lap is wet. In my mind, I really thought I was good at that. I was like, they could hire me for a Pepsi commercial. Anyway, let's get into it. When I read the synopsis for 365 Days on Netflix, I for real thought that was a Blumhouse style horror film. Cause I was like, oh, a psychological thriller where she's like gonna be trying to escape and outsmart him the whole time. Then I found out that this was more of like a Fifty Shades of Grey style fan fiction that's marketed towards women. And my first thought was, okay, do women find it sexy when they're the victim of a traumatizing life event. But aside from them glossing over every horrible human rights violation that occurs in this film, there's also really bad filmmaking involved. So many of the most cinematic or important events happen off screen between fades to black. One thing that this movie clearly had on its side was a budget for shooting on location. Cause we open with this gorgeous drone shot of some sort of, I don't know, castle by the sea in Italy. Everything here in this movie looks like it takes place in Count Chocula's crib stone walls, dark hallways. Just so you know, our main male protagonist, who is really the villain, his name is Massimo. And we open by seeing his father, who at this time is still the head of the whole mob that they're in, talking to some unsavory types about a boat full of refugees. Alcune, appena dodicenni. Un sacco di soldi. Mia famiglia non ha mai fatto questo tipo d'affari. Mi scusi, non volevo offenderli. I think we're supposed to be like sympathetic to the anti-heroes of this whole thing because they have a moral code where they never traffic children. Like a good guy. The dad just gets to walk away from the conversation for some reason and have a casual chat with his son on the side of the roof who is watching a mystery woman dancing on the beach. The dad says to Massimo that basically you gotta stop looking at girls with your binoculars. Questo sarà tu. So the dad gets shot right away. Massimo gets shot as well. The bullet goes through his dad and hits him in the chest a little bit. Now we jump ahead five years and we're in Warsaw, Poland. So this is where our main character named Laura lives. Laura, they call her. And she's in a boardroom taking no prisoners. It seems like she works at some sort of hotel. I had to watch the scene four times. They're just trying to establish that she does not get walked all over at work. I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and that's another issue that comes up all the time in this movie. The conflicts are not fleshed out. I don't know who the bad guys are at any point. Even that bullet that just went through the dad, I don't know where it came from. It didn't come from the guys who they just rejected their business deal on the roof. It came from the heavens. During her business boardroom scene, we also see Massimo, who is now the head of his dad's mafia type company. You can tell he stepped into the role because he started brushing his hair to the side. Makeup and hair note. And it shows how he does business too. There are some people who are like, we lost your money. And he basically is like, I'm going to blackmail you. I don't know how this is anything that the mob would do. I guess it is. But it's also like the mob dealings he's involved with are completely obscure. That's how they respect your intelligence as an audience member. So Laura comes home from her job where she's crushing it. And instantly we see her 
her relationship is not all that it could be. Her boyfriend is kind of a deadbeat. For some reason, he's watching TV while he's working on his computer, while he's listening to music, like pick one. And he turns her down when she tries to initiate a romantic evening. He's like, no, you have a weak heart and you have to pack for our trip tomorrow. So right off the bat, we learn two important details. A, she has a mysterious weak heart that comes up only when convenient throughout this movie. Just a weak heart. <laughs> I hate it because it's like, the fact that it can't even be a disease, it just makes it seem like, well, cause, cause she's a woman and she just has a weak heart. Don't yell at her, she'll pass out. The next day, uh, Laura and her friends are in Sicily for her birthday. She's turning 29 and we get a little more details about how her boyfriend Martin is a deadbeat. For one, he's always wearing shorts and a t-shirt, which in the world of costume design means he's not well dressed. Outside of Martin, she has her best friend Olga with her and Olga has some guy with her that we never meet, so don't worry about it. Throughout this movie, our main character, Laura, has the hardest time finding her way to simple places. Every time she turns a corner, you would think that she has lost all memory of where she's been that day. I'm like, sweetheart, was your mama a goldfish? So here's her getting lost and we get our first interaction between her and her soon-to-be lover slash kidnapper slash torturer. Uh... Are you lost, baby girl? What in the Mary Poppins? How did he just disappear? Is he part wizard now? Is he a vampire? I can't stand a movie that has someone disappear out of nowhere when there's no reason for it. Like he's not magic. Did he just dive into those bushes? Did he just book it to that little bungalow? He was like, are you lost baby girl? By the way, I'm sorry if I keep imitating the accent. It's just hilarious. Throughout the movie, he keeps saying, are you lost baby girl? And it never once sounds right. It never once is delivered in a way that's like, ooh. I'm not anymore, sir. Take me to wherever I need to be. It never feels like that. It's always like, no, <laughs> shut up. The next morning is Laura's actual birthday and Olga and her are talking about how Martin really doesn't care about anything but himself. And even on her birthday, he went out on some hiking trip and saw all the sights because she was sleeping a little late. And this is where we end up when Martin tries to make it up to her. Huh? That's right, the same revenge device we're used to from such masterpieces as High School Musical 2, Camp Rock 2. I really wish they could have given us stronger examples of him ignoring her because at the dinner last night, he like sang to the whole bar and he seemed like he really loved her. So it would be nice if we could like actively see him flirting with other women. Like there's so many opportunities for that in this setting. And another classic example of Laura not knowing where she is at any time. She's like looking out at the ocean and crying and then she starts to walk home but seems completely bewildered by where she is. Even though cell phones exist in this world, GPS is a thing. But instead we get this long drawn out montage of Laura looking around every dark alley. She knows her hotel is not on while they play another song. All of the songs in this movie are so ridiculous. They're storming every castle and I'm like, what castle? I don't care. Now to me, if you're gonna make a movie about kidnapping, then you gotta show me the kidnapping. Okay, I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. But instead, 365 days has this awful habit of fading to black right when something interesting's about to happen. What's it, huh? the most peaceful kidnapping ever. You just bump into somebody and he says, good evening, and then yada, yada, yada. The next morning you're in a new nightgown. I was completely bewildered when this happened because I'm an audience member watching this for the first time. I don't know if she's waking up in her hotel. I don't know if there was a cut scene in between that I missed. Like they really left me hanging here. From the establishing shots, we see that Laura is trapped in this massive castle-like compound somewhere. And she's running around the hall when she finally encounters my Massimo, her captor. You had the bad reaction to the sedative. I think you should have a drink. Because nothing mixes with sedatives quite like alcohol. Like, what is this movie doing? Next, we go into a very expositional bit of dialogue where Massimo explains his entire intentions for kidnapping this woman, which are so outlandish and far-fetched. This really might as well be Mary Poppins. I'm waiting for a chimney sweep to come down and, and whisk them all to a magical land. I wouldn't have believed it's true until I saw you at the airport. When my heart stopped, I saw you. Every day, I had this image in front of my eyes. I was looking for you around the world. 
One day you will stand in front of me and be mine. Uh, so in case you didn't catch that, when Masamo was shot along with his father five years ago, he was having these visions of this woman, like the one he saw at the beach, standing over him and caring for him. And apparently this was a person who looks exactly like Laura. And after he recovered, he looked all around the world to find this person from his fantasies. Uh, what? And he has portraits of Laura all over the house. He's like, I had these made because I was always looking for the woman in my vision. Did you have a police sketch artist come over to paint these portraits? There's some magic at play here. I know when I see a Harry Potter castle that there's some secret wand waving going on in the background. They don't want you to see it, but McGonagall's on the case. At first, Laura's protestations seem really accurate. She's like, let me out of here. I'm not your property. And he's like, I know, I know. It's like, you don't know, because I just woke up here. The motivations here just seem completely out of nowhere. It would probably be more interesting if he was actually kidnapping her for some monetary gain and then he somehow falls for her. But that's not what they went with. It was predestined because romance. But we can tell right away that uh, he's not like other kidnappers. I won't tie you up, but don't provoke me. I can't be gentle. I'm not used to tolerating disobedience. So you won't tie me up unless you really want to, is what I just heard. He makes all of these promises being like, I'm not gonna force myself on you. I'm not gonna tie you up. And then he does all of those things. So a lot of mixed signals there. Finally, we get the line that sets us up for this whole romantic adventure. You have 365 days. I'll do anything so you can fall in love with me. If next year on your birthday, nothing changes, I'll set you free. If that were me, I would be like, like, she's not acting like she's been kidnapped. I'm not showing all of it, but like, in addition to these lines, he's grabbing her by the throat, holding her up against the wall, making her really fear for her life. But every time he's like, and you're gonna basically die here, she's like, hmm, keep talking. I just, it really glosses over the, the whole kidnapping thing to the point where she's like, I have friends, I have a boyfriend, I have family. And he's like, what, that boyfriend who cheated on you? Cause his guys went and got pictures of the boyfriend cheating that day. And he's like, well, guess what? We sent someone back to your hotel. We got all of your stuff and we left him a note saying that you were breaking up with him and leaving Poland. But at least we know what the premise is now. She's officially kidnapped. Congratulations, welcome to your new home. I hope you love risk restraints. Meanwhile, the guy's sort of like, old older mob boss father figure. He's like, excuse me, you kidnapping this Polish girl is going to create a conflict between us and the Gattuso family. We don't know why it creates a conflict. There's this like vague tension between Polish people and Italian people throughout the movie. I don't know if that stemmed from a real life political situation. You can let me know in the comments, but I shouldn't be left wondering that as I'm watching the movie, right? I feel like they should be doing a little more work to explain to me why it's creating a conflict. So he leaves her and he goes right back to his old ways of, you know, torturing prisoners. Se tu mi solo derubato sarebbe finita così. Invece hai deciso di vendere dei bambini ad un bordello. Oh, he's a good guy, mob murderer. He'll murder you if you try to sell a child to a brothel. We are really setting the bar so low. I would aspire to have a partner who doesn't commit any type of violent crime. Is that okay? <laughs> Can I have that as a treat? But instead we're like, okay, okay. So he's actually like looking out for the children. Laura is sitting in her sexy big stone shower um, and she decides she's gonna make a run for it. Laura just has the worst spatial reasoning when she gets to the outdoors. Anytime she's anywhere with a corridor, she doesn't know where to go. She's like, oh, pathways, just run. One of them is gonna take you to the exit. It's a big castle, it's not a maze. So she's running around and we get more of this movie's habit of showing us good stuff off screen that I guess is a way to make it the movie seem less violent, but is actually making it confusing. <laughs> Laura witnesses that guy who was all tied up get shot off screen. And right on cue, this activates her general weak heartedness and she passes out. The weak heart was given to Laura just so that she could pass out when they had no other way to end the scene. It's like when you lose a Pokemon battle. She's always fully dressed when she wakes up and it's like she never once has to change her own clothes. I wish I could be her. If someone could brush my teeth for me every night and then leave, that would save me a lot of effort. And yes, I am accepting applications, but you've gotta have tiny fingers because I wanna bite them off. <laughs> 
It wasn't me who changed your clothes, it was the mate. Well, in the last scene, you forcibly grabbed my breast, so I'm not really concerned about who's changing my clothes at this point. I've been stripped of all my human rights. Like, why do they choose the most random times to make him seem like a gentleman? You kidnapped me. But, okay, you had the maid change my clothes. Can the maid call 911? Immediately after this failed escape attempt, Laura is asking for her cell phone and her laptop, and it's like, no, honey. Which is another issue. Like, she's basically seeming cool and defiant right off the bat as a kidnapped victim, and she doesn't know anything about this guy who's taken her, except for that he's capable of kidnapping her and murdering someone in front of her. So she should be much more scared, in my opinion. She should be, like, really afraid of this man. But already, as she's going down to breakfast, you can tell she's like, it does seem like a nice hotel. She also gets access to Domenico, which is, like, basically her assistant. He's sort of like the butler from the parent trap. And then they try to make it seem like she somehow has not the upper hand on the situation during the first of many, many Sicilian shopping montages. It shows her like racking up charges, working with salespeople to find the hottest clothes, and then those two bodyguard guys are carrying all of her packages. It's like, okay, Disney Channel original movie. And after she like puts some charges on his black card, she walks away being like, <laughs> that'll show him. Girl, you can't even leave right now. What are you so smug about? Acting like this is female empowerment? I can't. How are you gonna act all like in charge and powerful when this is the next thing that happens? I order it and I'm gonna decide when I'm gonna see it. Even though that's the opposite of what he said at the beginning. I won't do anything without your permission. She goes from feeling all powerful by shopping with his money to literally being choked out for saying the wrong thing. And this is supposed to be sexy? What? What kind of relationship history does Laura have for any of this to be intriguing to her? This encourages her to try to escape one more time, and we realize just the extent of Massimo's power. Come on, get up, me and I need help. Buongiorno, signore. Are you lost, baby girl? Stop saying that to me. This would be the point where I just run over that ledge there and jump into the ocean and I'm like, nope, your baby girl's good. She just went for a swim. And then I would swim to Poland. I really think that this line is supposed to be like his sexy catchphrase where he's like, are oh, you lost baby girl? But it's creepy every time. It creeps me out. I want my cell phone and laptop. Now, and something normal for dinner. Pierogi. You made her, you made her monster. Now that's empowering. She demanded pierogi from him. Also, like, how are you gonna just have told the cops that you've been kidnapped and need help and then be like, I want my laptop? Seems like you would probably call the police right away if I gave you that, so it's not happening. We get 95 minutes of this, like, brutal behavior towards the female character, and then these brief instances where they try to make up for it by having her turn around with attitude. He'll fully shoot her in the uterus, and then she's like, well, I just bought a $200 dress. You made a monster. These are not equivalent things, and I, it makes it seem like the best a woman can do to get back at a man is spend his money, which in this case is not the best she could do. The best thing she could do would be like, scratch his eyes out. I just hate it. I hate this whole movie. But she's like, fine, I'm gonna put on my best dress and all of my makeup and go and press you for this dinner. Like if I was someone's kidnap victim and I was still in the escape phase of my Stockholm syndrome, I would not be putting on my best mascara for him. I'd be like, you get what you get. I'm wearing a sweatshirt and I'm eating sloppy joe and you're gonna make it for me that would be my version of being demanding i would be like i want a can of hormel's chili with no beans huh you made a meanwhile massimo keeps getting these mysterious text messages from a woman named anna who's begging for him back being like i'm not giving up so more to be revealed on that later but already it seems like laura is starting to get interested in this man this mystery man she's like well what do you do and he says i own some bars some clubs and some restaurants which is like, to me, that's not a mob guy. That's a business owner. Aside from that, over dinner, Massimo opens up a little bit and lets her know what Laura is going to do for him. I'd like you to teach me how to be gentle. Well, I don't think I'm a teacher, baby girl. Do you see a whiteboard behind me? Do you see flashcards? No, why is it my job to teach you? Just like a man to expect a woman to come in and fix everything about him. This movie is so toxic! I wanna be in a relationship with someone who already knows how to be gentle. If I can't have a conversation without you choking me out, that's a deal breaker for me. I'm not gonna try to repair that. If you wanna learn how to be gentle, do that thing where you draw a face on an egg and take care of it, like in high school. Not my job. But for some reason, even though this more 
morning, she was trying to tell the police, help me, I've been kidnapped. When she gets back to her room, clearly the sparks have flown. The cell phone and the laptop are there. And she calls her mom and is like, my mother, I've gotten a year contract for a new hotel. It's in Sicily, so you'll never see me again. I'll, t I'll call you later. If I told my parents this, they would be like, who's kidnapped you? The next morning, there's a sexy dual shower scene. Have you ever been to a place where the whole room is a shower? Because this man has the home designed like a YMCA gym. There's more vague threats of why Laura should not provoke him. He's Every sentence, he's like, do not provoke me. And she's like, well, what if I call you a bitch? Like, you already know he's gonna strangle you every time you make him mad. And I'm like stressed out watching this. And I will stand by the fact that this movie could have been interesting. Like, if you took away all this romance, or even left it, like, I could see a movie being interesting about a woman being kidnapped and then falling in love with her captor. Like, we all know Stockholm Syndrome is a thing, Patty Hearst. So make it about that, but make it realistic. Like, they could have had a couple conflicts by now where she's trying to escape or trying to get her cell phone. Like, that could be interesting because there would be moments of suspense built in, but it also shows how headstrong she is, but he's just one step ahead of her every time. It would establish that she's really smart and clever, but he is too, and he really wants to keep her there. But instead, and this happens. <laughs> Do you guys remember when he said, I won't tie you up? <laughs> Why is she just sitting here tied up like it's no big deal? And I don't even know what she's fighting against. Every two seconds, she'll run 10 feet away and then come back to him like she's intrigued by the romance. It's like you either want to escape or you want to sit on his lap. You have to pick. They fly to Rome because there's the Leaning Tower of Pizza. Nope, I just said pizza like the whitest idiot. <laughs> pizza. The little big pizza. I'm Italian, so I can say it in Italian. In the big, 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 the building. Also, that's not the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That's clearly the Colosseum. Send me back to high school and staple my feet to the floor until I learn something. That's the only way we're gonna get out of this mess. Massimo is talking about his new girl possession to some guy who we never see again other than this scene. Meanwhile, can we get a napkin for Laura over here who seems to have never had gelato before? Hmm. I'm bored. I'm dirty. Stop it. If you're so bored, maybe you can ask the nice man for a wet wipe. I've been walking around Italy. I'm not gonna be touching my mouth with my bare hands. Wash your hands, people. This is Laura. Ugh. I'm bored. Mm. I reenacted that with blue cheese. That's weird. Now my hands smell like cheese. In another classic case of tell, don't show, we learn more about how Laura is the perfect manic pixie dream girl slash human slave. Si la va in Fontana? No. Vuoi scommettere? I'm not gonna look far. Couldn't you use the bathroom? Fountain is closer. <laughs> what a card. She was bored, so like a child, she jumped into the fountain. If you can do that, you can run away. You can run home and escape. Like, she seems to really be enjoying that she gets whatever she wants, and to me, that's a problem. Like, you seemed like such a strong, capable woman for like two seconds at the beginning of this, and now you basically like being treated like a toddler. And she still seems completely unaware of the stakes of her situation, which makes the stakes seem really low and in consequential to me as a viewer. The stakes always need to feel high. Like I need to understand why every character is doing what they're doing. Both of their character motivations seem so weak to me right now. And it would have taken no effort for the screenwriter to ratchet up these stakes. This is my favorite part of movies is building why the characters, it's life or death that they do the thing that they're doing. So for example, how come instead of conveniently having envisioned a woman who looks exactly like Laura, why couldn't it have been that one of Massimo's guys went rogue and actually kidnapped Laura as part of this heist or something that went wrong? And then Massimo catches him and is torturing that guy, being like, you know we don't do this. But in the process, Laura sees him commit some sort of murder or another crime. Then it becomes really important to Massimo that he keeps Laura there because it's life or death for him. Him. Either she stays or she escapes and he goes to jail for his crimes. That way we can also still build up that he's a moral guy who wants to do the right thing, but he's just in this situation.
situation. And then furthermore, rather than having Laura just have had a little fight with her boyfriend, what if it's a big fight with the boyfriend and with Olga and everybody that she's with, she runs away right before getting kidnapped. Then it becomes this thing of like, she's gotta get back to her phone the first two days or they're gonna get on a plane and fly home and never search for her and she'll be lost forever. This is just literally the one idea that came to my mind. The screenwriter could have spent more than one hour thinking about the conflict here and given us a better story. But hey, to further confuse me on how much danger Laura is even in here, she's like walking around this castle. Like she walks into Massimo's room and he's always naked in his free time. By the way, he is so hot. Regardless, she like saunters into his room and starts interrogating him, starts basically antagonizing him. So like you would expect, he violently ties her up. They stole a few shots exactly from 50 Shades of Grey. And then every time he does something physically domineering or verbally abusive to her, she tries to get back at him with fashion. I'll show you what I mean. Dress up. We need to be in one of my clubs in two hours. See, she looks terrified by him. She like slams the door and she's like, I can't go out there. And then minutes later, we get this. He's gonna kill you and then he's gonna kill me. And she's like, so what? So what? He just choked you. He brings you to within an inch of your life and you're like, well, I put on sequins. But of course, this boils over to a big issue that we immediately escape by cutting the scene. One of Massimo's like gangsters is trying to assault Laura because of her short dress, which is great. Great message to send. <laughs> Right when the scene starts getting good, we just easily transition to the next day where Laura's contemplating life on a boat. Uh, why do they keep cutting away from the action? It's so annoying. We don't see Laura's reaction to any of this or how she gets out of there. We just like, again, black out and show up in her bedroom the next day. All of a sudden she's just like, Hmm, remember bubble tape? I loved that. I can only assume it's gotta be with something about making this movie profitable in all territories. Questo significa guerra, la guerra tra due famiglie. La unica cosa che puoi fare è mandare via Laura. This is where I was like back on board a little bit. This is a worthy conflict. The guy that Massimo shot has created some sort of big war between him and a rival mob family. And then Laura starts freaking out. She's like, you killed that guy, you killed that guy. And Massimo's like, well, it's your fault because you wore that little dress. Oh my God, blaming the victim. Granted, she calls him out and she's like, you're blaming me because he tried to do that to me. A lot of people are just gonna take this movie at face value and not see that this is really purveying harmful stereotypes. This movie is not without its physical comedy as we'll see in this scene. Laura, where are you going? Stop it! <laughs> me when someone tells me not to jump to conclusions. Ah! Because of her weak heart that all women have, this could have nearly killed her, splashing into some perfectly blue water. That could have made her dead. Her heart is so weak it can barely get blood from her toes to her head. Naturally, after saving her life, Massimo is feeling even more connected to his concubine. And he gives a line that basically sums up this entire movie. I'm so grateful that you're alive, but in the same time, I wanna kill you. Yeah, I got that from how your concubine constantly groping me and then threatening to kill me. Mm-hmm, that's the man for me. After this on the boat, Laura and Massimo have the most prolonged, I guess explicit, softcore looking love scene I've ever seen. Like you see so much pubic bone. It's very much like watching Cinemax after dark if you guys ever saw those. But that's what I keep thinking when I watch this. I'm like, is this a movie made for women who don't have access to the rest of the internet? But Massimo says, oh, I've got a surprise. I'm taking you to a ball tonight. And she's like, but I've got nothing to wear. Enter this movie's only two gay characters. Nope, there's four gay characters, but all of them are hairdressers. Not every gay person has gone to hair school, okay? Just me and every other gay person that I've ever met personally. But don't worry, we love these guys because they lead us right into another makeover montage. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> I'm fearing for my life. Like she has so much fun on this year long kidnapping excursion. It's insane to me. I just wish that she had a little bit stronger of a connection to her old life. It's basically like she didn't exist before she met Massimo, which granted is the problem with a lot of these movies, but oh, I hate it. Massimo and Laura do a sexy tango at the ball, which is somehow lit like the rave scene we were at earlier. Why are there flashing red lights? I worked on movies where all of the club scenes were lit like this and it was actually 
really cool. Like they bring down the lights and they shoot a blue light at a shiny board and then spin that board. So the reflection gives you that spinning siren look. It just doesn't really match up with this location. Like it's a fancy setting that doesn't take long for the ex desperate girlfriend Anna to show up. And I could swear, I swear to you, this is a beat from Fifty Shades of Grey. And I think Twilight too. The first and real love of Massimo, La Mazzo. Don't kill her, kill me. I'm the one who's had to sit through this for an hour and 13 minutes so far. Nothing feels precious to me anymore. Massimo is like, hey, don't worry about Anna. She, I loved you before I even loved her. She would always see your portraits in my house and she never believed that I would find this girl from my vision. And I'm just like, yeah, of course she didn't. I wouldn't believe that either. You're crazy. I'm surprised that Anna wasn't like, wait, you found the girl from your drawing? You found the made up girl from your drawing? A few weeks ago, I did a psychic soulmate drawing where a psychic drew a picture of my soulmate. This is essentially what Massimo is doing. He's like, mm, I had a cute dream once and I will find her. Find who? Your brain made that up. Massimo tells Laura that she has to go back to Warsaw because it's not safe for her here. I'm not clear if it's not safe for her because of Anna, who I think is connected to the rival family, but they never specifically say it. Or is it just because of that other family from the guy that Massimo shot? Again, I'm not really clear on which conflict is leading to which act Action. It doesn't need to be this confusing, but there's just general danger. So Laura is sent back to Warsaw, Poland, where he's got a small apartment for her. And then Laura doesn't like any of this being sent away from her now person that she loves. Okay, we're almost done, you guys. In Warsaw, when Laura is talking to her friend Olga, who we met at the beginning. Olga, by the way, is like, where have you been? Why did you escape from us? What the hell? Which I guess is realistic. You know, like, why did no one call the police? To me, it's like, I would be super suspicious if some note that wasn't in my girlfriend's handwriting was left in my, my girlfriend, like I have one. <laughs> what is this, sixth grade? I had a girlfriend from one recess to another. Danielle, take me back. If I saw a running away note and wasn't in someone's handwriting in a foreign country and I never saw her again, I would be like, oh yes, police? Were her employers like, oh, that's Laura, always going to Italy and never coming back. Like, this is Dateline 2020, call the cops, private investigator, put the police, on it, get the radio scanner, APB, flashing lights, Kanye West, hmm, what? So it seems like when she's talking to her friend here is the only time that she acknowledges all of the details that make this situation severely messed up, severely unworkable. You know, she's like having this romantic time and she's like, we went shopping and I put things in paper bags. And one time I was on a boat and I got nailed. <laughs> but what about the fact that none of this stuff is hers? She has to go wherever he says. So at least she seems aware of that here, but it's crazy that it all gets fixed with yet another self-care montage. <laughs> Wysyłają mnie do Polski, ja nic nie. Wychodzimy. Co? He threatens to strangle me. I saw him shoot somebody. I fell off a boat once. And the friend's like, I know what we have to do. Champagne kisses, shabby our dreams. You deserve nothing but all the fun of the eating. Here we have our other two gay characters, which is like another pair of hairdressers who are giving these girls another makeover as though that somehow fixes all of the problems. Also, it is a movie sin. Movie sin for a character to go through a big hair change and have a salon sequence like this but they don't do the turning around thing where they reveal the new haircut. Yeah, that woman with the short blonde bob is Laura. She went from being a long haired brunette to someone with a short bob and we can't get one of those Mrs. Doubtfire thing where she goes, Oh my God, I love it. And the friend is like, what's Massimo gonna think? And she's like, I don't care. That's how that scene should have ended because that gives me like a full understanding that she changed her hair. If she just walks out of the elevator looking completely different in the next scene, it took me like a long time to be like, wait, is that Olga or is that Laura? Also, Olga says some problematic things about Italian people in this movie. She calls Massimo mozzarella and says that she turned his brain to pesto. At this point, I would love if someone would turn my brain to pesto. I would just blow my nose over some pasta and call it a night. This is what bothers me is like when a movie looks so good and it just falls apart at the story. And I mean, in this case, the acting is not great either, but it's like they are shooting in these beautiful locations. They're all over Italy. They have the cameras, the cinematography and the lighting, but then nobody wanted to write a coherent script they were like, eh, we'll just have them have sex on a boat, it's fine. Like you could have made this story beefy and juicy and, and these same characters could have been interesting. Like, let me understand why she's falling in love with Massimo. Like, let
let me see some of what she sees that makes me fall in love with him too. But so far, all I get is this. Call me old fashioned, but when I get kidnapped and brought to a distant castle, I like a little romance. Put on some boys to men while you do it, okay? We have another long drinking montage or party montage where the girls are like, ah hoo, ah hee. And then guys are hitting on her and she's like, no, no. So I get it, she's hot. She's hot and Italy is full of horny people. Gotta say, if you're from Poland or Italy, your town seems fun. Nothing is more exciting in the movies than watching the full length of time it takes for someone to wait for an elevator. They cut away from the action when she was getting kidnapped by mobsters, but this we have to sit through? Okay, that makes sense. They really build out any of the stuff that's easy to shoot, like any of those montage things. You just have one guy on a steady cam or handheld camera, and you have the background actors going. The director just calls out to them what to do. Oh, click glasses. Oh, flirt with that guy. Oh, you're dancing, you're having fun. It's the quickest thing to shoot, but then they clearly don't show us any of the stuff that's longer or more complicated to block or shoot, but they can certainly show her shopping at five different designer stores while some song plays in the background that's like I put a candle to my heart light it up light it up do, 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 do. candle heart that's all the music in this movie I'm gonna rise like a don't make any promises touch me touch me touch me as she's escaping, oh crap, I forgot to say, while she's at this club, Martin, her ex-boyfriend, finds her. Small world that he just ends up in the exact place that she is. And he similarly is like, I, I want to take you back. This is another trope that we see in a lot of fan fiction or young adult books where it's like, she gets into this new relationship and then the old guy sees how much she mistreated her. I keep punching this plant. I'm so sorry to the aloe plant. Mwah. Ouch. So he's like following her all the way home and for some reason he makes it all the way up to her apartment door. But when she gets back to the apartment, surprise, Massimo is there, which sends Martin running. He's like, oh, we'll be in touch, but don't worry, we never see him again. Just like her weak heart, we never hear from it again. After she fainted the last time, she doesn't have a weak heart anymore as far as the story is concerned. Martin gets chased off and we have this beautiful line that we love so much from Massimo. You look stunning, baby girl. I already know I look stunning, okay? There's been a whole montage about that where two gay men fixed my hair. I don't need to know that from you, baby girl. What's her name? Laura says, I don't need 365 days. I love you. So she's been fully Stockholm syndrome, fully brainwashed. We love that for her. Will you marry me? I don't think it's cool when people get me dressed while I'm asleep. Okay, Massimo, I can put my own ring on. I wish, I wish, I wish I was joking, but we have another shopping montage where Massimo is carrying her bags and she's trying on silver dresses that he's like, no, 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 no. My girl will never wear this. And they just look like two cool, hot Italian tourists. Maybe there's a lot of product placement in these and that's why we're getting all these montages, but I really feel like they're just trying to be like, women love shopping. And I'm not saying it's not empowering for for a woman to get back at a man by spending all of his money. I'm here for that. I just don't think it's enough to make up for the fact that I was stolen away from my whole life and my parents don't know where I am. But speaking of which, we finally get to meet the parents, which is another big step in most young adult novels. So they try to give us this moment here, but they botch it and I'm so confused. What is this? So Laura and Massimo are shopping as we said, and then they end up finishing that montage at this wedding that we never heard about, that apparently her parents are attending or participating in because these two strangers come up and we're supposed to immediately understand that this is Laura's mom, which I didn't know. I was like, who's this secretary? Until she says, mama, or whatever. You'll see when they greet each other, I'm like, does this woman love her child? Clara bien. Massimo, nice to meet you. <laughs> My mom is asking what do you do for a living? I'm a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> really? You will be the first in our family. Why are you having a conversation like you're a bunch of aliens who just assimilated onto this planet? They're like, <laughs> how are you? I guess because he says he's a gangster, they take it as a joke and they're like, okay, well, we'll get to that real answer later. But it's like, when? The next morning, Laura joins them for breakfast and pay attention to what she says at the beginning of this clip. It becomes important later. I don't feel well. Domenico will take you to the doctor. You said that nobody from Poland can come to our wedding, but I would love to have my best friend to be next to me. All right. 
She'll be your bridesmaid. When did he say that no one from Poland could come to the wedding? Because he forgot to do it when the camera was rolling. Like, they're always alluding to conversations that happened in between scenes. And that's really frustrating for me as an audience member. Because it's like, can't you just have that conversation now? What if she were to say, oh, my best friend needs to come. And he's like, well, no one from Poland can come. And then tell me why, because I never get that either. It seems like the two families, like one is Italian and one's Polish. And that's part of the issue, the rival gangs. But if it's not said explicitly, I'm just here being like, what? When did they say that? Meanwhile, Laura just seems completely oblivious to the fact that she's tiptoeing on the verge of death as long as she's involved with the, with the mob family. I think you don't like me, Mario. I don't like this situation. You know that you have caused some commotion. Oh, by being kidnapped? I caused some commotion for you? Was that really hard when I got kidnapped? Did that make things complicated for your job? Like, what are we talking about? It's like not her choice to even be in here. Ugh. The victim blaming is so insidious and subtle that it's like it permeates every part of the script. So Olga lands here in Italy because of the wedding and they're going shopping together. And Olga seems appropriately shocked by the wedding that's coming up in just a couple months. But also, they reveal some key information about Laura in a way that I swear they want me to miss. Like, they don't want me to get this piece of info. Yep, that's right. Laura's pregnant. This was alluded to in the scene just prior to this where she said, I don't feel well. I'll go to the doctor. We don't get to see her at the doctor. We don't get to see her informed that she's pregnant. That really made me think they must have cut a scene in between. Maybe it just wouldn't have been sexy for Laura to say I'm pregnant. Like, uh, I don't want to see some pregnant woman riding the D. That's bad for the D. So anyway, the friend Olga was just like, this is stupid. This is crazy. You don't know him. He's in the mob. Don't do it. And then she's like, but I want to. And Olga's like, okay, let's hug. I could go insane. It'll make me crazy in Sicily. Twisty pasta. We're in the home stretch for this movie, but don't worry, because I know you wanted just one more designer dress shopping montage. And they totally give it to us with the most see-through wedding gown you've ever seen. It might not feel like it, but we're rapidly approaching this film's climax. The climax is typically the biggest point of the movie, and it happens somewhere at the beginning of the third act. In our case, it happens just minutes before we end, and it's also not that climactic. Somebody calls Mario on the phone and tells him that they're about to kill Laura. I don't know who's about to kill Laura. I don't know who that guy on the phone is. I don't know how he got the info ahead of time that they're gonna kill Laura. Like, it makes no sense to me. But immediately he's like, run, we gotta go tell Massimo. And it's like, I don't see how that's gonna help based on what I just learned. It keeps intercutting between Mario racing home to the villa to tell Massimo what he learned and cutting back to Olga and Laura in the car. Laura's on the phone with Massimo being like, oh, I've got news. It was very suspenseful because I was like, oh, this is about to go down. Can we talk after dinner? Did something happen? Dove è Massimo? In piscina. Laura? Laura dies mysteriously off screen after entering this tunnel, and that's the end of the movie. I wish I was joking. I wish I was joking. Like, what? Why does Mario even spend all of his energy trying to race home to tell Massimo that Laura's gonna be killed, when even if he got there in time, Massimo's just on the phone with her. There's nothing they could do to help. What? Wouldn't it be so much more cinematic if Laura and Massimo were together? Or if we at least saw Laura pull into that tunnel and we see like some mysterious people up ahead looking all dangerous because I actually do like the thought of oh the murder happens in this tunnel and we just see that she never comes out there's something cinematic and cool about that but I don't understand any of the action surrounding that and it feels so out of nowhere it feels so out of nowhere like what am I supposed to learn here from the fact that she fell in love with her captor who was never nice to her got pregnant with his child who he was never gonna raise in a loving way and then the wedding just never gets to happen and we fade up and pan out over the ocean it's like there was no message to this story. It wasn't even like love conquers all because we didn't get that where it's like they refused to let this family battle get in between them. Like the family battle got in between them right away. Oh, what a mess, you guys. So all in all, I can say pretty confidently that I don't like this movie 365 days. I thought the script was incoherent at 
best. And at worst, it was totally misogynistic and gave the audience the wrong idea of how women can exhibit their power, how relationships should work. What do you guys think? Am I tripping? Did you enjoy this movie? Maybe I'm just taking it too seriously, but I really didn't understand most of it. Like I could get past all of the misogyny if, if the story at least made sense, but the character motivations don't line up with anything. So let me know what you think. I would love to hear your thoughts. Also give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns and let me know what movies I should cover next in the comments below. Then most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for getting Italian kidnapped with me today. I will see you next time. Mwah.